How do I run? How do I run? No, go, 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 go,
Player statistics can be updated automatically after every game and you are always able to examine every player's abilities and past performance to make certain you select the best players and put them in the most useful position in your lineup. Should you ever feel lost, you can check with Earl to see what play he would recommend at any point in the game. As we have already expended nearly all of our free time playing Earl or Baseball, we are quite certain this Electronic Arts offering is the best sports simulation game of the year. It's going to take one heck of a lot for another new offering to bet a home run like this one has done. Well, I think we should check on what they felt a little later from April 1988. Upgraded to 5 out of 5 stars, this fantastic computer game still ranks as the premier baseball simulation game yet released. The IBM version is quite playable, but if you've tried the Amiga version, the IBM version might leave you disappointed. Earl Weaver Baseball could still be the best sports simulation of the year. So while I love Dragon Magazine and commend them for recognizing this was a game worthy of review, if their definition of role-playing is any game which puts you in a role other than your own real environment, literally every single game other than a game about your job is a role-playing game. That definition is crazy. It's a sports game. It's a simulation. It's not a role-playing game. So what made nice Earl Weaver Baseball so great when it was brand new, and then 10 years later when people were still talking about it, to this very day, looking back on it as a definitive title, is just how realistic this game is. Everything feels like baseball. Look no further than this 15-hit, 1-to-1 tied game in the 11th inning. If you were a baseball game with graphics at that time, you were, for our arcade fun. Pop some home runs with some imaginary named characters because baseball didn't want anything to do with you. Statistical based games with math going on in the background is what constituted realistic back then. Well, of course the realist. If you take a 300 hitter with 25 home runs and you use math to calculate what he will do in a season, of course he's going to be around a 300 hitter with around 25 home runs. Now, how is that anything special? No. Clutch hitting like this. A bloop fly falling into left field for a walk off winning hit in the bottom of the 11th inning. That is something special. That is something no statistical game is going to give you. Now you can have blowout games where you win 14 to 2, but you will also have games where you're up by three and then you load the bases and the other team hits a grand slam and you lose by one. You will have all types of games. How do I know this? Well, because I did something nobody's done since the 1990s, I'm sure. And that is I played a 162 game season to see how realistic this game actually was, going where nobody today would ever go. Well, sort of, anyway. It's a little complicated. I actually think this is not such a great game by default out of the original package. Earl Weaver came on one disc, which included a few all-star kind of teams. Think uh, Lou Gehrig, Ty Cobb, Babe Ruth, Al Kaline. You know, the best of the best. If you want to see if Babe Ruth can hit a home run off of Bob Gibson, that's what the original game had to offer. Something I could not be less interested in. And beyond that, while the game lets you accumulate stats for your own seasons, it doesn't actually schedule any of them for you. So I think the game actually requires some separately sold add-ons from EA to actually fulfill its greatness. And that is through the Commissioner's Disc, which I'm showing you now, which allows you to schedule the leagues and have all of the teams play each other and add up to, you know, whatever season you want them to. Have days off in there as well. An utter pain in the butt if you wanted to do that yourself. And along with the Commissioner's Disc, I feel separate yearly roster discs are essential. I want to play a baseball game with the actual players of that time period when the game came out new. 
There were officially licensed discs from EA, which covered the 1986 season all the way through the 1990 season, along with a whole slew of unofficial ones, which covered a whole lot more. And all of them are extraordinarily difficult to find online. I had to rescue my own discs of the 1987 season in order to get these uh, players. Some very early examples of separately sold expansions from EA, though a million times better than releasing a full game every single year, which had nothing but roster updates, a thing they continue to do to this day, I believe. Here, it's actually kind of respectable because it's cheaper than the actual game. You're just getting roster updates, it should be cheaper, although they really should have included the 1986 season on the original disc, not some all-star fantasy leagues. From Family Computing, October 1987. In some news of the time period, Statistic Simulations Incorporated and TSR shook hands on a five-year licensing agreement. I recently recovered a Cursor of the Azure Bonds, so you want to check that one out. The only thing missing in Rural Weaver Baseball are the hot dogs. With its unprecedented graphics, sound, including voices and stereo effects, and smooth play system alone, this would be a great game. But the addition of extremely detailed player statistics and manager options make this the best baseball simulation to date. If your hand-eye coordination isn't up to the job or you simply want to concentrate on the intellectual side of baseball, you can opt to manage only. This in itself is a large task. Earlier baseball doesn't stop at just letting you play and manage actual games. It also allows you to be the general manager or even the commissioner. As the general manager, you may trade, draft, and create players. While as the commissioner, you can create new leagues and teams. Or simply grant everybody the day off. One of my only real complaints is that the computer always controls the fielding, except for throwing, even if a more arcade-style game is desired. Also, the pitching is not as detailed as it could have been, allowing three general speeds and only three zones with large variations in pitch height not allowed for. The biggest fault, of course, is the absolutely unforgivable lack of hot dogs. David Lettingdon. So some things that they got into, like the voice synthesis, absolutely amazing. People don't give the Amiga's voice synth enough credit. If anybody ever talks about it, it's to go into Workbench and uh, use some swear words. They don't give it the respect it deserves. This was amazing in 1987. This is something other sports games strive for, to give you the feeling of actually being there. 1993's World Series Baseball from Sega. You know, when CDs came out, that was the first thing they did, was put audio on the CDs to actually pronounce all the players' names. And it does great with them, because there's the actual spelling, and there's a separate phonetical spelling. You can even put your own names in there if you want. Sounds are equally amazing with sampled cracks of the bat, the roar of the crowd you know, going upward a little bit, some cooling off, and then the umpires. It's incredibly atmospheric. To get into the commissioner aspects of that magazine talked about a little bit, I really don't think you're going to find them all that useful, unless you're into a cheating and trading the worst player on your roster for the best player on another team. If you're honorable, it might be useful, but it lacks the AI that later baseball games oh, would give you there. You can also draft, again, extraordinarily tedious. You have to print every single player, refer to your printed sheet, and every single player has a number on it, and that's how you draft. Draft player number 50. You don't actually see the player's name or their stats in the game. Wow, I wouldn't want to do that. Though at the time, there were people that loved that for their fantasy leagues. In fact, the fantasy league aspect was so important at the time that it actually made it into the manual. My thanks to Intric8 of Amiga Love for scanning this for me. Check him out in the upper right or in the description of the video. Definitive baseball title and nobody's got the manual online. Unbelievable. Thank you, Amiga Love. Setting up your own league by Russell Sipe, commissioner of the Computer Gaming World Baseball League. A little bit of a conflict of interest to have one of the magazines that will be reviewing you in your actual manual. Setting up your own league is the most exciting way to play Earl Weaver Baseball. How you set up your league is determined by your answers to the following questions. How many team owners do you have? Is your league strictly a face-to-face -face league or can Earl manage some or all the time? How often do you meet? How long will the league last? And so forth. Even if your league doesn't provide cash prizes to the victors, you should at least have a league trophy or 
or trophies. Beyond trophies for the league champions, you might provide small trophies to the teams that lead the league in the number of categories. Good luck, Commissioner. <laughs> Not even a remotely interesting aspect to me, but it was something a niche amount of people uh, loved, I guess. When I die, just right on my tombstone, the source loser that ever lived, Earl Weaver. Earlier baseball's baseball simulation lets you play at the depth and the level of detail in which you feel most comfortable. If you want to get into playing ball and managing teams, you can use the arcade play manage or manage only options and enjoy the great American pastime. And if you're a hardcore baseball junkie, you can use the general manager and commissioner options to control everything from individual player statistics to ballpark design. A break in the manual to talk about simulating other teams. Now I am playing as the Detroit Tigers. If I want a realistic season, I need to include other teams playing, and it all has to be done manually. Again, I use the commissioner disc to set up the schedule, but then I have to use the game in order to actually place them. Kansas City at Baltimore. Now, you can speed it up a little bit by selecting the one pitch option, and again, Earl, the computer, is controlling everything, but even at its best, it's still going to take you at least... 20 you know, minutes. It's certainly tedious, but it's what allows for a very realistic season to uh, accumulate. Gotta tell you, I played a 162 game season. The other teams only played a 25 game season. I just couldn't take it. It all began in St. Louis, where Earl's father owned a dry cleaning firm. Among his clients were the St. Louis Cardinals and the St. Louis Browns. Needless to say, the Weaver family made many trips to Sportsman's Park. As a kid, I would carry the uniforms in and out of the clubhouse, says Weaver. In my mind, there was never any doubt that I'd make the majors. Earl enjoyed an outstanding career as a second baseman for Beaumont High, and after his senior year, the Browns and the Cardinals both wanted to sign him. In the minor leagues, Earl was named most valuable player in his league, Two out of his first four years, and all four of his teams won titles. After eight years of beating the bushes, Earl decided he wasn't going to make the majors. And late in the 1956 season, he became the player manager for the Knoxville Smokies. During his 29 years as a major league manager... No, I'm sorry, but the Knoxville Smokies do not count as Major League. Earl Weaver's disdain for defeat drove his teams to an incredible 1,407 victories, which actually was accurate at that time. Uh, it's not including the 86th season. He has a total of 1,480 victories in 17 seasons. His distinctive flair for managing an uncanny ability to consistently produce winning clubs enabled him to compile a winning percentage of .592. It's actually .583. Wherever Earl went, he won. During his entire career, his clubs posted only two losing seasons. I could only find one his final year in 86. It's simple, says Earl. I love baseball, and I love to win. A nice little history on Earl, and thanks again to Amiga Love for providing that manual. Over to Amiga World, November, December, 1986. Why Electronic Arts is committed to the Amiga, Part 2, The Class of 86. Eddie Dumbrower, seated at the crack of the bat, the voice of the coach, the seams of the ball. November, 1987. The number one arcade blockbuster. Check out my review for Arkanoid. Boot Me Up to the Ball Game by Bob Ryan. Bringing your baseball fantasies to life is easy with Earl Weaver Baseball, the latest Amiga game from Electronic Arts. Earl Weaver Baseball puts you into the dugouts and out of the diamonds of the most famous ballparks in the world. Places like Tiger Stadium, the Polo Grounds, and Wrigley Field. And lets you hit, run, throw, and manage your way to baseball glory. If you've been looking for the ultimate computer baseball game, your search is over. Not content to produce an arcade game or a strategy game, Electronic Arts did both. The arcade game lets you control your pitchers and batters, and to a limited extent, your fielders. The strategy game, the heart of early baseball, lets you manipulate a lineup of big leaders in a battle of wits against a friend or against a computer opponent designed to act and react like Earl Weaver. The choice of ballpark greatly influences the play of the game. A 320-foot fly ball to left field in Fenway Park is a home run. It's just another out in most other stadiums. Earl Weaver Baseball comes with eight built-in teams composed of National and American League All-Stars from four periods from 1900 through 1975. The stats that form the basis of the player's performance are not lifetime stats, but the stats oh, from the player's best year. 
For the ball game, you switch to a beautiful colored graphics representation of the park you've chosen. The display is a split screen. Most of it shows the field, while a vertical strip on the right shows a close-up of the picture and better. The animation is very good, especially the close-up of the pitcher's window. The digitized sounds used for crowd noise, the crack of the bat and the umpire's calls are excellent. A lot of attention has been paid to the presentation of this game. Down to small details is the sound a foul ball makes when it hits the screen behind the plate, the rotating baseball seams, and the way the umpire signal fair and foul. The graphics and sound are a great complement to the game. Oftentimes, while managing, you won't have much to do. Your batters will be hitting away and your fields will be playing it straight, even then though. The game is exciting because you're watching the lineup you choose in action, waiting for the opportunity when your play calling will make the difference. Or you get some hand-eye coordination and you play and manage like me. They then go into quite a bit of detail about creating your own fantasy leagues, but uh, we'll skip to the end. Earl Weaver Baseball not only surpasses all other computer baseball games, it has made me put away my copy of APBA Baseball, a board game that I've played since high school. You've been working hard, you owe it to yourself to try Earl Weaver Baseball, especially if you love the summer game. Get together with some friends, start a league, and have a good time. I'd write more, but I have a crucial series scheduled against the Lindas, one of the fantasy teams. See you! At the ballpark, Earl Weaver Baseball, Electronic Arts, 1820 Gateway Drive, San Mateo, California, 94404, NTSC Game, 43 Aspect Ratio, 4995, plus 1795 for the 86 teams, plus another $20 for the eventual commissioner's disc, so $100 to make a good game. Now, Amiga World noted the influence stadiums have in this game. Now, while every sport has home field advantage. No sport has it quite oh like God. baseball. You know, baseball stadiums have personalities that extend beyond the home crowd. Certainly the way the grass is grown for football games, American or soccer. You know, that has an effect how wet it is, whether it's even real grass or for hockey. There's the consistency of the ice and how a puck will bounce off the boards or the glass. These things matter, although probably not in a video game even to this day. With baseball, everything is affected by the current stadium you are playing in. I imagine Micro League Baseball was the first to actually offer all of the unique stadiums, but this one is right up there as one of the first. How good of a job does it do in actually representing the stadiums? Well, I can certainly speak for Tiger Stadium. What matters in terms of actually playing the game is largely correct. The foul territory dimensions, how far it is to the center field wall, 440 feet to a deep center field, but it does get, you know, visually it doesn't look like Tiger Stadium. Number one, it's green, although Tiger Stadium was green prior to uh, 1978, but after that they painted everything blue. The height of the walls, I think, are technically correct, but in reality, the actual wall only went up for like, you know, six feet. You could climb the walls at Tiger Stadium, and then after that, there was a fence, so I think it's counting the fence. But even here in Seattle, with one of those awful cookie-cutter stadiums they made in the 60s and 70s, just look how big the foul territory is compared to Tiger Stadium. So, even one of these awful later stadiums, you know, they have a little bit of a personality. A great example here is the deep center field, and you know, that's a home run in a lot of ballparks, and it's a home run here, but that's because it's an inside the park home run. There were quite a few of those at uh, Tiger Stadium. Back to Amiga World, December of 87. The 1987 Amiga World Editor's Choice Awards. The How Many Votes Can You Stuff in One Box Award. Earl Weaver Baseball from Electronic Arch. This game is our all-time favorite. Best use of an Amiga software, hardware, anything you can think of product ever created by humans during this century. It beats sliced bread by a loaf. Saran wrap can't touch it. The paper clip pales by comparison. Penicillin is just another mold. Well, you get the idea. The staff really liked Earl Weaver Baseball and wanted it to win twice. From our staff of five, it received 162 votes. And there's also the word processor we've all been waiting for award going to WordPerfect if you want to check out my review for that. From November of 88, the top 40 all-time Amiga games. 
coming in as the third best Amiga game of all time and the best overall sports game. Although it includes an arcade option, this heavyweight simulation is not for joystick jockeys. Earl Weaver Baseball is the closest you'll ever get to managing a Major League Baseball team. You can make all the moves available to the likes of Sparky Anderson and Tommy Lasorda, and you don't have to worry about being fired if you make too many wrong ones. This game is a must for everyone who loves the summer game. Okay, I must respond to the snarky remarks about the joystick jockeying. Just because you suck at the game is not a reason to demean the play and manage mode. The ultimate challenge of this game is to, yes, manage everything and also to play. You be responsible for every hit. You swinging the ball because if you suck at the game, you're going to strike out every single time. And you can probably believe the guy who played 162 games in this mode. And at the end of the seasons, my stats were not inflated for the most part. The results of my 162 games of playing and managing ridiculously accurate numbers other than the stolen bases. You know, that had to do with the difficulty settings that I eventually settled on. And the fact that I will always find an exploit for stealing bases in baseball games. Daryl Evans hitting 32 home runs, he hit 34 in real life. Alan Trammell hitting 29 home runs, he hit 28 in real life. 20 here for Chet Lemon, 20 in real life. 20 here for Kirk Gibson, 24 in real life. You getting an accurate picture here? Even the strikeouts, which you would think would be all me, and for the most part, you know, they were me. But even there, the people who got more strikeouts in real life got more strikeouts in the game. And just like in real life, not everything always turns out the way you're expecting. My uh, platooning catchers are an example of, you know, definitely not living up to expectations. You know, pitching is an example where the difficulty settings, again, are coming into play. I won way more than I probably uh, should have, although I got tons of saves, too. There are lots and lots of close games. The hits were about right, but I was always able to throw out the people stealing on the other team. That's like the running, even when I figured it out on the hard difficulty settings, simply something I did not want to deal with, so I didn't. But still, ridiculously satisfying numbers for a game which is physics based in 1987 not statistics based and I was the one responsible for hitting the ball if you just want to sit there and stare at a screen for 40 minutes and occasionally bark in order at which the computer will then respond to that's fine if that's what you want to do but don't you dare Try to uh, satisfy your fragile little ego by belittling the people who are using their hands too, in addition to managing. It's a simulation, even in the play and manage mode. Info, September, October, 1987. A magazine which is still handmade, now in two spare bedrooms, by a full-time staff of four dedicated computers using only consumer-grade Commodore Amiga and compatible third-party hardware and software. We are the only Commodore Amiga magazine which is entirely produced and managed with this equipment. Amazing computing is computer-produced, but on a Macintosh! The Amiga 500, receiving four and a half... Out of five stars, when Commodore announced the Amiga 500 and Amiga 2000, they were planning to introduce the 2000 first. With the 500 following about two months later, but public demand for the less expensive model was so overwhelming that Commodore switched priorities midstream. The Amiga 500 has all the capabilities of the Amiga 1000, plus some. Earl Weaver Baseball also receiving four and a half out of five stars. I must confess that I am not a big baseball fan. You don't need to chew tobacco, though, to see that this is the ultimate computer baseball simulation. Split screen action, instant replays, radar gun, clocking of pitches, variable levels of play, optional management responsibilities, and a page long list of features and options allow casual players as well as certified baseball psychotics to find total gratification with this game. Now, how about Chuck Knox football for us, a pigskin proponent? B.D. Brian Dunningham. And in November of 89, Earl Weaver Baseball would make it as the 8th best simulation game. In the sports category, our favorites are TV Sports Football, Earl Weaver Baseball, and Jack Nicholas' greatest 18 holes of golf. All extremely realistic, addictive, and fun games. From those Macintosh designing traders, oh, hope for that amazing computing, cream. August of 1987.
Reviewed by Keith Conforti, Earl Weaver Baseball by Mirage Graphics Incorporated and Electronic Arts is a baseball strategist's dream. The programming by Eddie Dumbrower is a powerful bounty of six graphics and strategy. Behold, split screen. The graphics are fantastic, even though the colors aren't too developed. Animation of picture and better are simply superb. I am really impressed with the stats compiler in Earl Weaver Baseball. I love to read the Sunday sports page, and I've got to head it to Dumbrow and crew again. These stats are heaven. Earl Weaver Baseball is the first baseball simulation that does not rely on flashy graphics, though they are fantastic. To hook its users, the game, intentionally and intelligent done, is an excellent simulation of real baseball. Earl Weaver Baseball should become the addictor of media games, and I'm sure you'll keep coming back for a fix. This is what computer games are all about. So if you're a baseball junkie like me, you should throw out the first pitch and sign up Earl Weaver Baseball to captain <laughs> your team. So let's talk about the graphics. Amazing computing called them not flashy, though still fantastic. And I would agree. They are deceptively good in that it would be far too easy for people today to look at this game and say it really doesn't look like anything special. Hardball came out not long after this, and at first glance, you'd look at that one and you'd think, obviously, that one looks better, but actually, Earl Weaver Baseball has something graphically about it that was not only impressive when it came out, but makes it to this very day impressive, and that is, it uses medium resolution, workbench resolution, 640 by 200. At least that is my educated guess. I can't actually confirm that without taking a screenshot on the actual Amiga, which this game will not allow. But that is most definitely the system font that we see in the text. It becomes plainly obvious when you take a look at the Microsoft DOS version of the game. Now, the menus are relatively similar it's because DOS is using a text mode, which is equivalent to medium resolution. But once you get into the actual game, just take a look at that scoreboard visit and home. It can't fit the name of the team onto the scoreboard. At first glance, you might think that the players look rather similar, but no. once you put the magnifying glass on it, you can see that they're much blockier in this DOS version, besides being ugly, ugly uh, CGA. There was an EGA version released a couple years later, but it's not that pretty either. And just for a refresher on the great animation, they are small, but they pack in a lot of little detail into these little guys. Watch as the outfielder reaches up with his glove to snap the ball. That is really good animation, not only for the time, but because it's utilizing 640 by 200 medium resolution to this day. It is an impressive, graphically speaking, Amiga program. Amazing Computing, August of 1996. Been following the Amiga market lately? <laughs> As the Amiga's era in the U.S. waned so almost of necessity that it's linked to its great national pastime long before Commodore called itself out. In April 1994, sports publishers had set their sights on the larger, more lucrative IBM and console market. It was not always this way. Between 1986 and 1992, a significant number of computer baseball games made their way to the Amiga. It was on the Amiga that Earl Weaver Baseball, easily the most highly regarded baseball game of its day, made its debut. Earl Weaver Baseball, the great one, the classic, unsurpassed and, at this late date, probably unsurpassable. At the time, it seemed to have it all. Great ambient crowd sound, still unequaled even by the best IBM games. Use of the Amiga's built-in speech synthesis, the first true physics model in a baseball game, a rich storehouse of stats, and a wealth of options that allowed you to play just as you wanted. It was more than a game. It was the first true baseball simulation, and watching it was scarily like watching real baseball. From June of 1998, Computer Gaming World. It's a whole new ball game with the arriving 3D Baseball Revolution by Terry Coleman. Long before EA Sports aspired to Babe Ruth like dominance, Trip Hawkins and EA shared a vision to create the best baseball game possible given the existing technology. Earl Weaver Baseball was a revelation in 1985. It used a physics based model, yet still managed to revival statistical based simulations in its accuracy. Earl Weaver was equally fun to play in action or coach mode, and the Amiga version in particular was so far ahead of its time that it was years before the game's sound and graphics were 
surpassed on IBM or 16-bit consoles. The sad thing is, despite more than a decade of technical innovations, no one has come close to capturing the magic of Earl Weaver. This year might finally be different. High Heat 2000 blasts one way out of here. After a dozen years, Earl Weaver Baseball on the Amiga is still the definitive benchmark for baseball games. Even the diehard Earl heads here at CGW are ready to admit that HH2K is a real winner. Over 10 years later, how many games do you know talked about in that glowing light over a decade after its original release? Be proud of the Amiga and what is intellectually a definitive title on that machine. Sadly, not talked about enough today. Certainly definitive on a personal level as well. It's one of the first games I remember my father playing. And uh, you always knew when he was playing it because of that intro music. When the Amiga was moved to my room, I played it just as much as he did. Here are uh, some of my custom leagues right here. With such teams as Bart and Cool Man, say hello to Mad Chris Tannen. I had a lot of fun with this game back in the day. And what I enjoyed most about coming back to it now was the strategy, in particular the left-right splits. Figuring out that I needed a platoon in right field with Pat Sheridan batting left against right-handed pitching and Larry Herndon um, batting right against left-handed pitching. Having three great first basemen but shifting Daryl Evans to third base because offensively he's a lot better than the actual third baseman Tom Brookins. Realizing that Daryl Evans is not so great against left-handers but he still hits enough home runs over 10 to justify putting him in there towards the end of the lineup against left-handed pitching. And utilizing previously mentioned Tom Brookins in a utility role when anybody went 0 for 5 or something, you know, I benched him and I put Tom Brookins in their place or somebody got injured. You know, Tom Brookins, he was the one in there. He still got into over 120 games despite not being the regular third baseman. This is all strategy I wasn't even thinking about in games made in this century. April 87, Computer Game World, Baseball FIFA Issue. From Johnny Wilson, undoubtedly the most exciting sports simulation to be released in years, Early for Baseball has it all. Although it's a statistics-based game, the graphics and animation are superb. In the play and manage mode, i.e. arcade mode, how big an effect can you have on the batter and his stats? Eddie Dumbrower. You can drive a batter's average down quite a bit. You can make him a zero hitter real fast. You mean you go for physics and trigonometry, it's not just percentages? Everything in this game is really based on the fact that the ball falls at 32 feet per second. Are you serious? Oh, yes. In other words, to the pricks who couldn't hit a ball to save their life, the play and manage mode is not an arcade mode. December of 87. Nominated for the Action Game of the Year, but losing to Gunship. Finally, the moment for the 1987 CGW Game of the Year award arrived. When we first saw this product demonstrated at the 1987 Winter Consumer Electronics Show, we realized that this program was going to come as close to being the perfect simulation of its subject matter that we had ever seen. With our involvement in the beta test phase, it came even closer to the ideal. Therefore, we are proud to present the 1987 Computer Game of the Year Award to Electronic Arts for Earl Weaver Baseball. Over a year and a half after it was first released, the readers placed in it as the second best strategy game. From May of 89, conspicuously absent from the top 100 are the three new inductees into CGW's Hall of Fame. This month, we celebrate Empire, Pirates, and Earl Weaver Baseball from Electronic Arts, entering the Cooperstown of computer games with an 8.82 rating. A more complete list from 1998, revolutionary physics-based baseball game please both action and statistics fans, still unsurpassed more than a decade later. Finally, November of 1996, the 150 best games of all time. Ranking as the 25th best game of all time, Earl Weaver Baseball. The Amiga version was a sports classic, from the stats to the graphics. Too bad the later versions gave it a black eye. It even got name dropped at number 128 for the 1995 Tony Larusa 3, the best of the Larusa series. The game has graphics and stat capabilities that sometimes outshine the original Earl Weaver. Sometimes, though. They don't. It's just so incredible and even moving that this game was liked. Not just in terms of a nostalgic feeling ten years later, but that it actually compared better against the new games released over 
a decade later. Absolutely amazing. Now, there's a lot I didn't get to show you or talk about, including reviews from three more American magazines, Ahoy, Commodore Magazine, and Compute, as well as three what? British magazines, CCI, Ace, and Commodore User. But let's compare the magazines I collected, 10 American magazines and three British, to the English Amiga rack at two British magazines and one American magazine. Amiga community, you can do better. Early River Baseball is an Amiga original. It feels like real baseball. It is a Hall of Fame worthy title and a definitive Amiga game. And I feel honored to have been able to cover it for all of you. There's going to be a lot more in the written review at shot97retro.blogspot.com if you want to take a read over there. Again, my thanks to Amiga Love for scanning that manual for me. If you enjoyed this review, I think you'd uh, probably like links. If you're into the realism aspect, then uh, Flight Simulator 2. And of course, FA-18 from Electronic Arts. And one more for the sports fanatics, TV, sports, football. I'm hoping I did this one justice and that you all enjoyed it. See you all later. Goodbye.